In the last lecture, we focused on how the Cold War began, and the main arguments that America and the Soviet Union had with each other. We also talked about how this war is cold because there was no actual fighting between America and the Soviet Union. Instead, we saw how Truman used money to try to spread democracy around, and Joseph Stalin, who was Russia's leader, tried to use his power and control over politics and people to spread his ideas. In this lecture, we're going to see how moving forward, things started to happen in other countries, especially with communism, and that causes America to get involved in hot conflict, where we have physical fights, though we're still not fighting Russia itself. The first country, as you can see in our domino effect theory, is China. In China, there was fighting going on between democracy and communism already. In fact, this fight had started before World War II and had been put on pause so that they could fight Japan when they were being attacked. The two main players for them were Zhang Zhixi, who you see here, and Mao Zedong. Zhang was the leader of the Democratic Party in China at the time. Not surprisingly, the United States supported him. In fact, they sent billions of dollars to him. On the other hand, Mao Zedong represented the Communist Party in China and again, not surprisingly, was sent tons of money from Russia. Unfortunately, Zhang Zixi's government was very corrupt and they misused the billions of dollars America sent them. In the end, in 1949, his government fell to Mao Zedong and China officially became communist. This happened, unfortunately, the very same year that the United States was scheduled to leave South Korea, which gave a great opportunity for North Korea to invade. To understand Korea and the beginning of the hot conflict, which was the Korean War, you need to know that in World War II's ending, Korea had been divided, just like Germany had. As this map shows, the country had been divided along what's called the 38th parallel. North Korea had been given control through the Soviet Union, and the United States was in control of South Korea. This was, again, just like Germany, where they were split into sections so each of the allies could help them get back on their feet and start their governments. Unfortunately, in 1949, the United States was scheduled to leave South Korea, which was the same year that China had fallen to communism. The United States had left a democratic government in South Korea, just like the Soviet Union had left a communist government in North Korea. But China becoming communist made North Korea feel more bold and they got together their military and soon invaded South Korea. Because appeasement had failed in World War II, Truman said that the US would help South Korea and sent troops there. He didn't want a repeat of what had happened in Europe. He was backed by the United Nations and sent General MacArthur the same one we talked about in World War II, who had so much success in the Pacific theater. General MacArthur was sure that they could win in South Korea. He also said that he was sure China wouldn't back North Korea up. So he took American troops right up through South Korea into North Korea. Unfortunately for MacArthur, China did help and they pushed the Americans back into South Korea. MacArthur wanted to try again, but Truman did not want to get into a war with China. So he told him, you're only allowed to go until the 38th parallel and keep South Korea democratic. MacArthur was very mad about this. In fact, he went against the President of the United States and wrote a letter basically calling him out, attacking him. When this letter became public, he was fired by Truman for insubordination. The fight was turning ugly and Korea was no closer to being won. But then Eisenhower became president and he ended it. 
Eisenhower came in with the same types of policies he had used when he was a general in World War II. Remember that he was general in Europe. So he was the one who led battles like D-Day. He came along and gave out hints that nuclear weapons would be used soon if an agreement could not be reached. When Stalin then died, the North Koreans were convinced that they might not have as much backup as they thought, so they signed a ceasefire that continues until this day, and everything went back to exactly the same way it was before the war, with South Korea being democratic and North Korea being communist. The fact that we signed a ceasefire means that technically this war has not ended, even though there's no hot conflict or active fight now. Meanwhile, in other parts of the world, the cold conflict continued with what was known as the space race. We talked last time about the arms race, which was weapon development between countries. They were also developing space items such as Russia's Sputnik 1. It was the first satellite to ever be launched into space, and they sent it into space in 1957. Though today, this does not seem like a very threatening satellite. At that time, it was a huge achievement, and it shocked the United States that Russia had done it first. This led to the United States passing the National Defense Education Act, which gave $1 billion to fund more science students and teachers. Although it gave us many things like NASA and rockets, of course, it also led to inventions like the microwave and the internet. This again displays America's capitalistic sentiment, even in the middle of war. Now, as we spoke about in Korea, Eisenhower became president and ended that conflict. He was not afraid to use his policy, massive retaliation. He invested very heavily in the arms race because he believed that helping in one small local conflict at a time would drain the US. So it was better to be very firm from the get go. In 1954, they announced that massive retaliation would be something America pursued, which basically meant that any communist threat American allies got, America would deal with by using crushing and even nuclear force. In other words, he was saying, I really meant what I said to Korea. Don't try me. Something else he did was use the CIA there was actually a lot of controversy about the way Eisenhower did this. The CIA had been founded in 1947 as an intelligence gathering agency, but Eisenhower now authorized the CIA to also complete covert operations that would protect American interests. In 1953 and 1954, he authorized them to basically topple the governments of Iran and Guatemala and install new anti-communist ones. Though they kept these countries anti-communist, there was some long-term resentment there and some questioning about whether it was right of the United States to do this. As you can see, his general mindset from World War II was still very much in play, and he was very different from Truman, who used money as his way of fighting the Cold War, while Eisenhower is going to use weapons, and intelligence. Meanwhile, the people of America were most affected by what's known as the Red Scare. You read about this in your vocabulary. This is basically the fear that communists were infiltrating and trying to destroy the US. It was so real that starting in 1938, there was a House Un-American Activities Committee, the HUAC, created. And it was really to prevent Nazis, fascists, and communists from entering America during World War II. However, it became mostly about communists in the 1950s. They had highly publicized trials after the war. And two of these trials were extremely important in finding enemy agents, but also created more of a scare. The first one was for a man named Alger Hiss. Hiss was a government worker 
who assisted with New Deal agencies and the United Nations. When his name was given at the trial of an ex-communist spy, he denied having known that spy. But a young congressman named Richard Nixon convinced the committee to press for investigation. Yes, Nixon was a lawyer at this time and had a big part in persecuting the communists of the Red Scare. This case did actually eventually show that Hiss had been part of the infiltration with communism. And it scared people to think that someone so high up and involved in the government could be part of this. Another scary trial for American people was Julius and Ethel Rosenberg's trial. This couple was a Jewish couple from the poor side of Manhattan, and they were charged with trying to send nuclear information to the Soviets. The case caused a lot of controversy because the evidence was mostly the word of an ex-spy. They said they were innocent until the very end, but were still sentenced to death by electrocution. Many thought that this was a case of anti-Semitism, but in 1995, secret Soviet messages the U.S. had intercepted in the 40s were released and confirmed their guilt. Just looking at these pictures, you can see why American citizens would be confused and concerned. These look like normal, everyday people. And one was high up in the government, the other was your average citizen. If they could be communists and proof was found, who else could? Now, in these two cases, the accusations ended up being true and evidence was found. However, that was not always the case, and some people exploited this fear. The most well-known for doing this was a senator from Wisconsin named Joseph or Joe McCarthy. In 1950, Joe McCartney gave a speech saying that he had a list of 250 people who were working in the government that were communists. When he asked, was asked to reveal the names, he rephrased, changed numbers, etc. And now people believe he only said that in the first place to win re-election because he promised that he would reveal the names if he won. Over his next four years in office, he became known for his extreme and reckless charges of people. The people accused by him lost their jobs and it ruined their reputations. Some of McCarthy's accusations got too wild, however. He started to accuse people in the United States Army, even including George Marshall from the Marshall Plan. In 1954, the Senate finally said that he had to televise trials to resolve these issues. And on those television trials, people saw his bullying techniques and he was publicly condemned for his reckless behavior. Within three years of the trials, he had died due to complications from his overdrinking. These trials signaled the end of the Red Scare. People realized that though there were some legitimate threats, we also needed moderation and freedom of speech in order to continue to be the America that we were fighting for. Because of this time of fear and hysteria, a lot of people, including Arthur Miller, who was at one point accused, have related this to the Salem witch trials where people were falsely accused and lives were ruined out of fear. So as you've read in the Crucible, they relate these two times. The next big part of the Cold War would be some conflicts that we would have in a crisis with Cuba, which had also come under Soviet influence, and in Vietnam, which was becoming communist. Those we will read about and study separately. So look for them in upcoming lesson plans.